First of all, I want to salute you, uh, the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. Your organization has become a real leader in this state. And that's not the easiest thing to do. Obviously, when you get a group together representing a certain segment of Kentucky, be that education or business or <coughs> pick out the topic, <coughs> folks tend to obviously gravitate to certain issues and it's very easy to become defensive and to uh, just look at yourselves and not look at the bigger picture. You haven't done that. As a matter of fact, you've gone just in the opposite direction. Over the last, I would say, 10, 15 years, particularly since this fellow arrived on the scene, Dave Atkins, the Kentucky Chamber uh, looks forward with a progressive attitude. Obviously, you're business oriented. That's what you are. You're our business community. But you understand that for this state to move forward, for your business to succeed, and for business in general to succeed in Kentucky, you have to look at the bigger picture. You have to look at things like how our kids are educated. You have to look at our revenue pictures. You have to look at our spending picture. And all of the different things that go into making up a successful state. You know, I served on your board. I, I'm one of you, and I feel like one of you in that I share the kinds of vision that you have for the state. I'm sure that we can find issues that we might not agree on, but I think the overarching issues that will make this state the excellent place that it needs to be for our children and their children, uh, we will agree on and we do agree on. So, first of all, let me say thank you. Kentucky is blessed to have a business community like you, and I wish you would give yourselves a round of applause. I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about sort of where we've come from and where I see us going. As Rusty mentioned, it was three short years ago in November of 2007 when I was elected governor. And I still remember Inauguration Day, December 11, 2007. Jay and I got up that morning, and it was a bit raining the night before. It was overcast. We went down to the church service to start off the inaugural ceremonies. And when we came out of the church service, the clouds had parted, the sun had come out, and we had a 70-degree day all day long on December the 11th. And some of you were there and remember that. We didn't even have to wear coats to the outdoor part of the inauguration. Beautiful evening, wonderful inaugural balls, everybody had a wonderful time. I got up the next morning full of vim and vigor, ready for my first full day as governor, went into the governor's office, and was met by my budget director, who looked me in the eye and said, well, I hope you enjoyed yesterday. <laughs> because in the next three weeks, we've got to cut about $340 million out of this budget to keep it balanced. That was the way I was greeted as the new governor of Kentucky. As Rusty said, it was just about that time when this recession hit us full force. Not only Kentuckians, but the entire nation and really the entire world. And we've been struggling with that just as folks around the world have been. But as soon as I saw what was happening, I decided to do two things. Number one was it emphasized even more than ever that we had to be fiscally responsible and that my job was going to be partly to steer this commonwealth through this recessionary period. And part of doing that is steering our government through this recessionary period. Thank goodness, thank goodness we cannot print money like they do in Washington, D.C. I know it would be easier, it would make our jobs easier in the short term, but we would be in a heck of a mess in the long term if we were able to handle our business like they do. And I'm glad we can. As tough as it is to balance budgets during times like this, thank goodness we have to do it. And we've done it. You know, for three years, 
about every quarter, as Rusty said, we've had to balance our budget. I balanced it eight times in three years. We've cut over a billion dollars in spending out of that budget in three years. We have the smallest executive branch workforce that state government has had in a couple of decades. And so we've exercised the kind of fiscal responsibility that you've been doing, that our families have been doing in Kentucky. Everybody's had to tighten their belt. Everybody's had to do more with less, and state government is no different. We've had to do the same thing. We've not only cut the billion dollars out, but we have looked at things just like you do. We've re we're reviewing all of our leases, all of our contracts, our salary structure, how we can combine different agencies and areas to get more out of that by spending less money at the same time. We've had a furlough policy for state employees. I don't like that. They don't like that, and I don't blame them. But it's been necessary. Uh, I, had, I had an easy decision there for me, and that was either to institute a six-day-a-year furlough policy or fire 415 people. And those 415 people I needed because they were delivering essential services to our people. And so I made that decision, and we instituted that policy. It applies to me, too. It applies to myself. It applies to all of my cabinet secretaries, everybody in the governor's office. We're taking six unpaid days. Now, I will tell you, I'm having to work my six days. <laughs> because this is, this is a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week job. But that is helping us to balance the budget. What I did as part of that is not only apply it to myself, but I stepped up along with folks in my office and my cabinet secretaries and took a voluntary 10% pay cut each year for the last two years. And we're continuing that right now. now. I know that that's a drop in the bucket in terms of balancing a budget. But if I'm going to ask state employees to sacrifice, and we are, then I felt like they needed to see their CEO the guy at the top of their pyramid doing the same thing and being willing to step up and share that kind of sacrifice for the, for the greater good of this state. And so I'm proud of the fiscal responsibility that we have exercised. Now, the other thing that I knew immediately that we were going to have to do and to be even more aggressive than ever came down to the number one priority that I think you have and the number one priority that I have. And I think it's the number one priority about, about every Kentucky. There is nothing more important to a Kentuckian right now than a job. Pure and simple. Our folks want to work. They want to support their families. They want to keep a roof over their head, and clothes on their backs, and food on the table. They want to send their kids to school so that those children can have even a better quality of life than the parents are experiencing. People need a job, and so we have spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last three years devising a strategy and implementing a strategy to do just that, to get new jobs in the state and just as importantly to keep the jobs in Kentucky that we already have. And folks, that strategy is working. About a year and a half ago, I had a special session of the General Assembly, and we passed a total revision of all of our economic incentive packages in this state. Up until that time, we had a great toolbox to work with a company from Michigan or California or New York that we were trying to convince to move into Kentucky and bring jobs. But we really had nothing in terms of tools that we could use to work with existing Kentucky business. Folks that have been here for years, good Kentucky corporate citizens, Folks that had employed Kentuckians for years who might want to invest more, might want to expand, might want to grow, but there was nothing that the state had that could incentivize them to do that. And so part of that revision was to give us the flexibility at the state level to work with our existing companies. And that has been extraordinary in terms of the results. Over the last year and a half, We've had 223 companies 
both new companies from out of state and existing Kentucky companies who have been preliminarily approved for one or more of the new or expanded tax incentive programs that we <coughs> formalized a year and a half ago. Those 223 what I would call economic development projects represent the potential of over two billion new dollars of investment in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. The potential of over 13,500 new jobs and just as importantly about 5,000 retained jobs or jobs that we already have that we would otherwise lose. So are we out of this yet? Of course we're not. You know that even as well as I do in your business. But I see things starting to turn. I feel good about where we're heading and we've got momentum going in the right direction. Look what we just did over at Ford. We just announced that Ford is going to invest. You know, two years ago, those plants were going to be closed. Those plants were going to be closed. We were going to have a lot of Kentuckians out of work. But we went to work with Ford, and as a result of that work, they announced not only those plants are going to stay open, they're going to invest $600 million and turn the Louisville Assembly plant in the, into the most modern, flexible assembly line they have in the entire world. They're going to create 1,800 new jobs in that process. But we're not done yet. We just the other day approved another amendment to their incentive package that is encouraging them to invest another $400 million a little bit down the road and create another 1,000 jobs on top of that. GE. GE Appliance Park in Louisville hadn't had a new product come in in 25 years. As a matter of fact, they'd all been going the other way. That place used to employ, I think, 25,000 people. It was down to about 4,500. Over the last 18 months, working with GE, we now have three new products, some of which are being brought back from China to be made in Louisville, Kentucky, and about 1,000 new jobs in the process. <coughs> And just as those are examples of big items, there are dozens and dozens of examples of smaller companies in all of our communities around the state where this is happening as well. <coughs> so that excites me. And it, it excites me because the fastest way and the surest way of us coming out of this recession is to come out of it by getting our people back to work. And, and creating a demand for more business that you are in, whatever that line of business may be. Because in the long run, if our Kentuckians are working, they're going to be paying taxes. And I'm going to get that tax revenue, and I'm going to be able to address most of the other problems that we have. So that, to me, is the key to the future of this Commonwealth, and I know that you share in that agreement and that feeling of where we're moving and where we're heading. Two other initiatives that I will mention briefly to you. One is the Kentucky Export Initiative that we just announced a couple of weeks ago. Do you realize that Kentucky's exports have grown over 83% just since 2000? From 2000 to 2009, our exports have grown 83%. There is a world of opportunity out here for small and medium-sized Kentucky business who are not in the export markets. And this initiative is going to bring together the U.S. Chamber folks, the Kentucky Chamber folks, the Cabinet for Economic Development, uh, the Kentucky World Trade Center, in an effort to basically start educating small and medium-sized Kentucky business about export possibilities, to help them identify markets, to help them understand the process of how to get in the exporting business. And that, my friends, is another great opportunity for our Kentucky businesses to grow and to expand and to create more jobs. Another program that's just kicking in that actually was a part of that total revision of the incentive laws is the small business uh, tax credit that is kicking in as of January 1. This is for companies with fewer than 50 employees. And there's the possibility of tax credits for creating one, two, four, six jobs, investing 5,000 or more in equipment and other types of things. And if you're interested in that program, contact our Cabinet for Economic Development because 
we want you to know about it, and we want to to get this this program kicked off in a great way. And I think there'll be a big demand for this program. Upcoming legislative session. I believe when the Constitution was amended, folks were told that we need a short session in case. We need to do some things that uh, come up in the interim. Uh, uh, we have some emergencies, whatnot. Well, as most of us know, uh, that short session has grown into a full-blown <coughs> session, just like the other one. Uh, and I understand that, uh, but I, I'm hopeful that that we take a look at what we really need to do, what we really need to address and that we don't get bogged down in a whole bunch of stuff that usually happens in a regular session. We're still putting together uh, our agenda, and it will be a, a rather limited agenda. But I know two things that we have to address. One is the shortfall in the Medicaid budget. Back when we passed the budget in the, in the regular session, the, the General Assembly assumed about $100 million more coming from the federal government than came from the federal government for the Medicaid program. We ended up getting about $100 million less than what they estimated and anticipated. Honestly, I wasn't in favor of going that route because I don't like to bet on something that we have no idea what's going to happen. And if, if any of you can predict what's going to happen in Washington, you're better than me. I would rather I would rather uh, go for some sure things, but we did, and and uh, and we ended up going that direction, and now we're about a hundred million dollars short. Uh, but we've come up with a solution. I proposed a solution uh, that will work, and what it's based on long term, and I, I think you'll be interested in in this, is that as you all know, Medicaid costs because it's health care costs continue to go up significantly every year. And we're fighting at the state government level to get better control of health care costs. And we've done some significant things. We've taken our state health plan, and we have zeroed in on preventive care. Uh, we've zeroed in on wellness. And we are working with that plan to make sure that we emphasize those kinds of things, because in the long run, I think that's what will hold down the increase in uh, medical costs. I think in both the state employees' health plan, the teachers' health plan, a lot of that uh, is going to help us in the long run. What I want to do with our Medicaid program is to get you in it. And by that, I mean the private sector. Uh, there have been other states who have engaged the private sector in the delivery of health care for their Medicaid population. And it works. Manage care as a term does work. And it works because it, it functions on a different basis than the usual program. You know, the, the usual program is what they call fee-for-service. What that means, very simply, is that uh, the doctor gets paid on how many times he sees somebody. He gets paid every time he sees somebody. Uh, the hospital may get paid on how many procedures or how many times somebody's in there or how many procedures can be done. And so, and I'm not saying that they all at once just click in automatically and say, well, I've got to make my money, so I'm going to see a bunch of folks. But that's what ends up happening. You know, there's no incentive in the, in the program right now for wellness. There's no incentive for looking at a provider and saying, you know, keep this person well. Keep this person out of the hospital. Work with them to, to make sure that they know how to take care of themselves. And so the managed care model basically is on the idea that Provider, here's X amount of dollars. There's your population that you're going to take care of. Now, if you want to make money, you got to figure out how to make money on this fixed amount of money, taking care of these folks. And it works because that pushes folks into the incentive of wellness and preventive care. You know, Kentucky right now, unfortunately, is at the top in so many chronic diseases. I like to be number one in a lot of things, but not that. But when you look at all these studies, we're almost we're right at the top in at what cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, diabetes, you name it, we're there. And this will help in that regard because those folks have those chronic conditions because they didn't take care of themselves. 
when they were younger and they developed all of these things. If, the, if we can educate our people more about how to take responsibility for themselves, we can save us a heck of a lot of money. We spend the most money on chronic diseases in Kentucky and on prescriptions in Kentucky. And so this whole managed care model, I think, will, will pay off for us. And so we're going to push that, and I think it will work. One other area that obviously I'm very interested in, and I know you all are too, is education. I've had two task force uh, groups working. One is our Transforming Education in Kentucky Task Force, which is looking at how do we take Kentucky's education system and move it to the next level. How do we continue to be able to compete with everybody else in the United States and around this world in terms of the education that we turn our kids out with so that they can compete in this 21st century marketplace? They're just now getting ready to come forth with their recommendations. I haven't seen them yet, and I don't know how many of those may be something that we can look at during this session, uh, and we'll take a, a good hard look at that. I do know, though, because they've talked about it extensively, that one of those recommendations will be to raise our dropout age from 16 to 18 here in Kentucky. Now, I remember I, I got in on the last of the, of the education part of Bureau's program this morning, and someone asked, you know, how do we change the culture in Kentucky of, of how we look at education, how we value education? And it's a tough question, and I thought they did a good job answering it. But I can tell you one way we do it. We send a strong message to our parents and our kids of just how important education is. We send the message that you're not going to drop out of school at age 16 just because you may not like this or that. You're going to get a high school diploma. Why? Because you will become a much more productive citizen if you do. There aren't any jobs out here anymore for the most part, for somebody that drops out of school at age 16. There's not very many jobs for high school graduates anymore. You're going to have to go on and get even more skills and more training as you move along. And I think it's very important for us to send that message to, to our parents, to our kids, and to the citizenry all around Kentucky that we do value education, we feel strongly about it, and uh, I'm looking forward to pushing that measure, and I think that one's on your list also in terms of the things that we need to do from an education standpoint. <clears throat> Let me just mention one other thing in closing. Over the last three years, as I've mentioned to you, I've had to balance the budget eight times. We passed this total revision of the economic incentive packages, and it's had great results. We passed some legislation that allowed me to negotiate <coughs> with a company that bought the Kentucky Speedway, and now we're going to have a NASCAR Sprint Cup Series race in Kentucky every year. That's going to be about $150 million of economic impact for Kentucky. We've done a lot of things. I didn't do that by myself. And I'm not up here to take credit for it by myself. You know how I did that? I did that by getting a Republican Senate and a Democratic House to come together with me and agree and find some common ground to move those issues forward and to accomplish those things. To me, the real definition of leadership, the practical definition of leadership, is not being able to give a great speech or to give some sound bites out here that, that will catch people's fancy. The real definition of leadership is being able to bring folks of different philosophies together and finding that common ground to get something done. That's the way we've done all this, folks. And those folks in the Senate and those folks in the House ought to be just as proud of what we've done as I am. And I think they are. May not hear too much of it this coming year. <laughs> I understand that. I understand that. You can't, you, can't, uh, you can't run against whoever's there unless whoever's there has done something bad or, or has not accomplished much. So I know we'll hear all of that. But we've done a lot. We've shown a lot of leadership, but we've shown it because we've come together to do it. To me, elections are one thing and governing is another. You know, rank partisanship has almost destroyed Washington, D.C. I don't care which side you're on. When the Republicans are in control, the Democrats will not cooperate, and vice versa. And folks, you don't move this country forward working like that. 
And the only way we've been able to move Kentucky forward is for me to get, and I've had this situation ever since I became governor. I've had a Republican Senate. I've had a Democratic House. The only way you move things forward is to put all this rank partisanship aside. Yeah, during campaigns, that's fine. I mean, we're all going to get out here and we'll campaign and everybody will go vote. But once that's over with, I think the people of this state expect their leaders to be Kentuckians first and Democrats and Republicans second. That's the way I've conducted myself for three years. That's the way I'm going to conduct myself during this next session and this next year, even though there's a gubernatorial race. There's plenty of time for the governor's race. We need to get through this session, try to get some good things done for the people of this state, and then we can all run our race. And then come next November when it's over with, and I'm reelected. <laughs> 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 <laughs>